Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Of all the sounds in the universe, perhaps nothing stirs the imagination more deeply than the sounds of the sea. People who have never crossed an ocean can still be transported in a walk along the beach, skirting the lapping tides, or standing high on the rocks with the waves crashing below. There's an eerie quality about the sea, and it conjures strange visions in any mind that is ready to receive them. Our story concerns the spell cast by the sea. Our mystery drama, What Happened to Mrs. Forbush, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elizabeth Pennell and stars Patricia Wheel and Gordon Gould. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Excuse me, madam. Oh, I'm in an awful hurry. I, I just wonder if you could answer a simple question so for me. So do I. The question is this. What? what happens this time of year? Oh, huh? that's easy. The kids get home from camp. Goodbye. Nope. What do you mean, nope? No. Nope. I mean, I should know when my kids get home from camp. Well, the answer I had in mind was a tad more general in scope. Well, see. I gave my answer. Let's hear yours. You know, I'm glad you asked. Are you? You see, what happens this time of year is that Buick dealers are giving particularly great deals on all their 74 Buicks. For a family woman such as yourself, I think a neat little Apollo would be just the ticket. It's small, economical, but surprisingly roomy. And it's a Buick, so it's really quite elegant. You don't say. Uh -huh. Now, isn't that good news? Yes. I mean, that you can get such a nifty deal on such a nifty small car. To be car. sure it is, yes. To be sure. By the way, uh, where do your kids go to camp? Guam. It's a Gu small island in the South Pacific. Guam. Uh <laughs> Suburban Savings in northern New Jersey would like to set you straight on savings. Straight off, Suburban offers you the highest interest allowed by law. A big 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban 7.50% savings certificates. And Suburban guarantees it from 4 to 10 years. Minimum $2,500. Federal regulations allow premature withdrawals on savings certificates, provided prescribed federal penalties are adhered to. Of course, Suburban also has a whole selection of other savings plans that keep your savings Savings headed in the right direction, straight up. Why not head straight over to your nearest suburban savings office, conveniently located in Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, Sparta, and Wayne, and let them set you straight on savings. This story takes place at Captain's Cove on the shores of New England. Bert and Marjorie Desmond are inspecting a picturesque old house on a bluff overlooking the sea. They're city people, and in the past they have spent their vacations at mountain resorts or in dry desert places considered beneficial for the health of their son. But this year it's different, and they're getting more intrigued by the minute as Mr. Smith, the rental agent, shows them around. Bert, the view and the window seat. I haven't seen one like this since my grandmother's house when I was a child. <laughs> I'm more interested in all these carved pieces over here. What do you call this stuff? Uh, scrimshaw. Oh, yes. The thing sailors made when they had time on their hands. Mm, old Captain had quite a collection. Most of it's over to the museum. What can you tell me about this ship model? A schooner, isn't it? Yeah, uh, that'd be Captain Forbush's ship, Desdemona. Sank. With old hands aboard. Oh, Mr. Smith, is that an island I see way out there? Nope. That's Dead Man's Rock. Oh, what a gruesome name. Was it the scene of a shipwreck? Well, I understand some fella got murdered on that rock. I don't rightly know the circumstances. Uh, but there is an island further on out, known as Hiram's Hideaway. It's said to be the place old Captain Forbush took himself off to when he wanted to get away from his wife. Good fishing. I'll have to look into that. Oh, Bert, are you sure we really want to take this house? Let's see the rest of it. There's a fine old staircase. <laughs> Beautiful railing. I don't think it's been dusted in years. This house has been closed up most of the time. That's why it's such a bargain. Is there anything wrong with it? Nope. Tight as a drum. 
and a real historic monument. Now, you take this roof. Oh, it's wonderful. I've never slept in a four-poster bed. Oh, boy. It's a big one, too. And uh, this door leads to a veranda. Oh, my. This porch goes all the way around the house. It always does in a captain's place of residence. A trademark, you might say. Well, sure. This is what you call a widow's walk. Yeah. Uh, no doubt Miss Forbush did her share of pacing when the captain was away. Well, no pacing for me, thank you. My husband has a desk job. What do you think, Bert? About the house? Y- yes. <laughs> in a strange way, I've fallen in love with it. But I'm wondering... Wonder no more. We're going right into that room I already call my study and sign a lease for the summer. Bert. Glad you've come to life. You haven't said a word since we left the cove. I thought you were asleep. No. I've been thinking. And worrying. Worrying? About Robbie. Robbie? <laughs> I can hardly wait to get his reaction when he sees where he's going to spend the summer. Bert, maybe we've made a mistake. Oh, you're kidding. No. That long, deserted beach and those rocks, it's a dangerous place for a boy. You'll have a ball. But it's not like any place we've ever stayed before. Have you forgotten how much of Robbie's life he's had to spend in bed? I haven't forgotten. But that's all over. The doctor said so. He said it was time Robbie started doing the things boys his age like to do. Not dangerous things. Bert, we're going to spend three months by the ocean. You bet we are. And the sea air will be good for all of us. Only, Bert, Robbie's never learned to swim. Well, Robbie, what do you think of it? Oh, man, this house is twice as good as you thought it was. I didn't remember it was so musty. The place needs airing. I'm going to open some windows. Dad, who's the old guy in the picture? Why, uh, that must be Hiram Forbush, the sea captain who built this house. He sure has a lot of red whiskers. (laughs) He sure does. (laughs) You know, they knew how to paint pictures back in those days. Watch this, Rob. Walk over here and see how his eyes follow you. Sort of as though he was looking at everything you did. It's spooky. You think he's a ghost? Oh, come on, son. You don't believe in ghosts, do you? No. Well, I'll I'll let you in on a secret. I think your mother does. Mom believes in ghosts? Sometimes. (laughs) Oh, Pop. (laughs) What's all this about ghosts? I'm teaching Rob to be the man of the house, so he can look after you when I'm gone. Hey, I want to go to the beach. Well, you can if your father goes with you. Not right now. I have some things to do. I'd go, only it's time to think about getting dinner ready. But I can go alone. Sure you can. Oh, no, Bert, not the first time. First time for everything. And speaking of first times, how about that? (laughs) It's so strange to hear a telephone in a house like this. Glad there have been some improvements since the captain's day. Guess I better find out who it is. Pop said I could go to the beach. Now, Robbie, I want you to be very, very careful. Follow that little path and watch your step climbing down the bluff. Mom, I'm not a baby. And don't stay away too long. Do you have your jacket? Oh, Mom. I'll be watching you from this window. Damn, damn, damn. Why, what's the matter? That phone call from the office. Wouldn't you know they're having a crisis and they want me back? Oh, no, Bert. We just got here. You're on your vacation. Won't be gone long. Just for the day to help get things straightened out. Oh, but it's a four-hour trip. I know. I'll have to start very early tomorrow morning. And I guess i better spend tomorrow night in the city. But you promised that first thing tomorrow you'd see about swimming lessons for Robbie. It was a part of our bargain. I know, honey, but it's just a matter of putting it off for a day. Oh, you said I thought I'd asked you not to climb on those rocks unless someone... Beach club and make arrangements for swimming lessons. And we'll meet some people so that you'll know the neighbors, and Robbie will have someone to play with. Robbie, dear, what were you doing on those big rocks today? Just throwing stones in the water. Mom, I can make them skip real good. I thought I'd asked you not to climb on those rocks unless someone was with you. I only climbed a little way. Well, no more climbing, young man, until your father gets back. But he's been gone for three whole days. Well, he's coming tomorrow. And we're going to let him know how well we've been getting along. Go to sleep now. I'm going out on the porch to watch the moon come up. Mommy, you promised to open the window very wide so I can hear the sound of the water? Yes, dear. (sighs) The weather's changing. I can scarcely see the beam of the lighthouse. It's getting all misty. And don't be frightened if you hear the foghorn. Uh, I like that sound. 
night. Good night, dear. Good evening. Oh. Is someone there? I always stroll the veranda on a foggy evening. Well, there is someone. Who are you? I am Lavinia Forbush, and I presume you are the lady who is staying in my house? Why, I guess it was your house. Only I'm staying here now. My name is Marjorie Desmond. Didn't they tell you, Mrs. Desmond, that I never left this house? It belongs to me. Belongs to you, Mrs. Forbush. Now it belongs to a man who lives in Boston. Ah, he thinks he owns it. No one will ever take my place in this house. Come, let's walk this way. Ah, the fog is creeping over Dead Man's Rock. Just the way it was that night. Uh, no, I'm getting rather cold. I think I'll go inside. Oh, poor soul, you need a fine shawl like mine to keep you warm. <laughs> it looks like a lovely old paisley. W won't you come inside where it's warm? We, we could have a cup of tea. No, indeed, Mrs. Desmond. I only set foot in my house when it becomes necessary to get something I want. I'll stay right here where I always stay, keeping my vigil... But the fog is closing in. <sighs> really, Mrs. Forbush, I must go in. Oh, how thoughtless of me. The damp night air must have chilled you to the bone. Here, let me put my shawl around your shoulders. <sighs> what about you? Oh, I no longer feel the cold as I once did. My, it is grand to have a woman to talk to once more. Mrs. Desmond, my captain was a bold and adventurous man. He brought me precious gems from India, from Persia, and from China. Oh, dear Mrs. Desmond, you must not make my mistake. You must take your most cherished possessions and leave my house. Oh, but I have no jewels, Mrs. Forbush. Oh, dear lady, you have the greatest jewel of all, a son. How old is your boy, Mrs. Desmond? <laughs> Robbie's nine and a half. Just the age of my Jason. A most dangerous age. I, I know. I, I worry about him. And well, you might. What happened to me is history. And history has a way of repeating. Really, I, I, I don't think I want to... You will listen to me. Please. My Jason... Oh, he was a strapping lad who helped me with the chores around the house. And when Hiram's ship was in, the boy spent hours talking to the sailors, learning how to tie knots and carve those intricate things from bone and bits of wood. <laughs> My Robbie would like that. And then one day, when Jason was nine years old, his father came to me and said... I'm taking the boy on a journey. It is time he began to learn the ways of men. Why, Bert said something too like... Too soon, I said, too soon. But my Hiram was a very determined man. And when he made up his mind, there was no stopping him. It's only a short journey, he told me. We are taking the Desdemona to the Caribbees. And Jason will go with me. I watched through the spyglass until the ship was far enough at sea to hoist the big sail which caught the wind. You do know what happened, don't you, Mrs. Desmond? Don't tell me anymore. I must, if you would save your boy. Late that evening, the fog closed in the way it has now. And then... Then began the long days and the lonely nights. Where is your son, Mrs. Desmond? Why, he's in bed. And I hope fast asleep. You hear that? Oh, yes. Foghorn is a lonely sound. It's a lonely sound for women like you and me when we've lost... Stop trying to fight this There's still plenty of time. For what? To take your son away from here. Take him away and guard him with your life. <laughs> A foghorn is a lonely sound. And a ghost-ridden house by the sea is an unsettling place for a woman who is worried about her son. 
perhaps in the light of day, when her husband returns, Marjorie will be able to shake her fears. On the other hand, suppose Mrs. Forbush is really trying to tell her something. We'll find out more shortly when I return with Act Two. There's nothing wrong with drinking Budweiser sip by sip, is there? Well, the brewers of Budweiser think there's a better way. Sipping's fine if you're drinking wine. But Bud is the king of beers. A hearty drink. Look, rinse a 10 or 12 ounce glass with cold water. Then, open a can or bottle of Bud and pour it right down the middle so it kicks up a good head of foam. Now, take a big drink and then swallow big. No sips. That's how it should be done. More taste, more beer drinking enjoyment. Thanks to exclusive Beechwood aging, Budweiser has a smoothness that lets it go down especially easy. Sure, it's an expensive way to brew beer, but brewing beer right does make a difference. That's why when you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. What's for dinner? Your ShopRite supermarket suggests choice beef first cut chuck steaks just 59 cents a pound this week. Save two on smoked ham, shank portion 69 cents a pound, but portion 79 a pound. For a quick meal, try Swanson's Frozen Hungry Man dinners just 99 cents each. For dessert, ShopRite's produce department is featuring fresh honeydew melons 79 cents each. They're great topped with ice cream. There's a lot more for a little less at ShopRite, so stop in soon. All that she can do She lets shop right to the rest Hey ma, what's for dinner? Shop right has the answer This is WOR New York, your mystery theater station If you're afraid of what the future has in store Perhaps you look to the past for guidance But Marjorie Desmond has had a strange encounter with the past, which only bolsters the fears she already has for her son. Is it possible that a ghostly presence from a former time can prevent or promote an impending disaster? Marjorie's husband has returned from his business trip, and we'll soon find out how he feels about what's going on. Bert, it's so good to have you back. Way longer than I expected. I've only been gone a few days. Same old thing. You should be used to it by now. Mm, But this time it was different. I mean, this place... Oh, no. Tell me what you and Robbie have been up to. Bert, I want to show you something. Hey, where did you get that paisley shawl? I like it. So do I. It has such nice, mellow colors. Where did you find it? In the old captain's sea chest? No. It was given to me. Well, that's a nice gift. Who's been around while I was gone? You're not going to believe this. Well, let me guess. It was given to you, only it wasn't really a present. You had to pay some enormous sum for it, and now you're afraid to tell me how much it cost. No, Bert. And I know you won't believe me. I won't believe you if you say Captain Forbush came to the door and said, My dear Mrs. Desmond, please let me in. I've returned from a long and tiresome journey. And it would please me very much if you would cook up some bacon and eggs. Uh, no, Bert. It wasn't Captain Forbush. I'm happy to hear that. It was Mrs. Forbush. What? You're going to laugh. I know you won't understand, and I didn't either. Only, only it happened. For heaven's sake, Marge, what happened? It was a foggy night. You sure? Spooks always come out on foggy nights. Now tell me, where did you really get that shawl? I got it from Mrs. Forbush. Let's not play games. I'm tired. She was there. She was where? On the widow's floor. Oh, cut it out. I talked to her, and she told me what happened to her husband. Sure, sure. Mr. Smith told us that. The captain was lost at sea. But Jason... Who in heck is Jason? Their son. Marge, would you please talk sense... Now, where did you get that shawl? I told you from Mrs. Forbush last night when we had a long talk. Now, I've heard everything. Okay, it's a joke. And I do think it's pretty funny. We're living in a haunted house, so let's enjoy it. If you don't want to tell me where you found that thing, okay. I'll play your game. 
At least until tomorrow. Don't you want to hear what she had to say? I don't want to hear any more of this crazy story. Come to bed. And tomorrow we'll have a great big laugh over this whole thing. And maybe you'll remember where you really found that shawl. That was the best picnic we ever had. Can we do it again tomorrow? Well, not every day, Rob. Maybe tomorrow we'll go to the beach club. I thought I might do some fishing. Dad, can I go fishing with you? Maybe we'll all go. How about it, Marge? Uh-uh, count me out. You know how I feel. Yeah, I know. You like to eat the poor little critters, but it's cruel to catch them on those nasty hooks. Well, it is. Robbie and I may just go off and forget to come Take home. Take your son away from here. Take him away and guard him with your life. Well, honey, what's the matter? You look as if you'd seen a... It's nothing, Bert, nothing. I, I just have to be alone for a minute. Hey, Dad. What are all these things over here on the shelf? That's called scrimshaw, Rob. Scrim? Mm -hmm. These are things that were made by sailors a long time ago. When they were on those sailing ships and the sea was calm, they didn't have much to do. So they carved pieces of bone or wood and painted shells. I bet I could do that. You'd have to learn how to use a knife. Would you teach me, Dad? It's uh, bedtime, young man, up the stairs. Mm, If I was on a boat, I wouldn't be going up any old stairs. I suppose you'd be climbing the ropes. Or walking in the gang. No, I asked that fisherman today where he slept, and he said down below. (laughs) Unless you want to sleep in the cellar, the direction is up. Get going. Aye, aye, Captain. (laughs) (laughs) Nice day today, Marge. And I don't know when I've seen Robbie so happy. Oh, he's certainly having a good time. And tomorrow when we go to the beach club, we can make arrangements to have him start taking swimming lessons. I'm not sure they have regular classes. Then we'll get him a private instructor. Marjorie, I am perfectly capable of teaching him myself. I won a medal in college, remember? Well, of course you're a good swimmer, Bert. And I thought... Oh, I suppose if Robbie had been well, you would have taught him long ago. But don't you think he'd learn more quickly now if an outside... Hey, there's nothing wrong with his old man, is there, Marge? (sighs) I have to finish up the dishes. Let's talk about it when I'm through. Robbie? Hmm? Don't be frightened. I want to talk to you. No, I'm the lady who lives here. My name is Mrs. Forbes. Say... Do you know the man with the red whiskers? He is my husband. And maybe you could tell me about that boat on the shelf downstairs. And all those other things. That ship was one of the proudest vessels to sail the seven seas. And Captain Forbush himself made that model. Do you think it would sink if I tried to sail it? Oh, you must never, never try. Oh, my dad won't let me even touch that boat with her sails. But I can play with the other things. You know, the bones and the shells. I know. And I brought you one that was a favorite of my son. He was just about your age. Now, do you have a candle I can light? There is one over there in the bureau, but I could just turn on this light. No need to waste electricity. I never had it in this house. That doesn't look like a match to me. A tinderbox. Best thing in the world for striking a light. There. Now, Robbie, what do you think of this? Wow. What a big shell. This is for you, Robbie. To keep for Jason while he's away. Where's he gone? I'm hoping you will help me find him. I'll be glad to help you. Because if he was here, we could climb the rocks together and, and explore that pirate's cave. We'll look for him, Robbie. We'll look for him together. So now, if you will come with me. Oh, oh I, I couldn't go anywhere without asking permission. But this is my house, and I am giving you permission. But I still couldn't go without asking. Quickly, boy. Come on. Put on your clothes. Uh, Mom! Mom! Dad! What is it, Rob? Why, Robbie, what are you doing with a candle burning? You know how dangerous... I didn't light it, Mom. You tell them, Mrs. Fort... Where is she? Where's who? That lady, Mrs. Forbush. She was standing right there. Oh, good Lord, not in here. Rob, 
There's no one else in this room. You've been having a dream. No, Dad. Honest, she was here. Look what she gave me. Not you, too. Say, that's a very interesting shell. So where did you find it? Dad, I didn't find it. Mrs. Forbush said it belonged to her son, and I could borrow it until he comes back. That's a likely story. You can make up a better one than that. But that's exactly what she said. I'm going to help her find him. And when he's here, we can play together down on the beach. No, Robbie, dear, that's not possible. You're both being impossible. But the trouble is, we have to find Jason. Oh, stop right? it, Robbie. I won't hear any more about this, Jason. Rob, you've had a dream. It seems very real. But now it's over. And tomorrow you'll have forgotten all about it. But, Bert, what about the candle and the shell? Well, there must be some reasonable explanation. But let's not think about it now. I'm blowing the candle out. And Robbie's going to sleep. Good night, son. You've been playing a joke on me, and I'll admit it's been a good one. You were very clever to get Robbie to go along with you. And I must say, he played his part well. But I can think of better games for a boy his age. This was no game, Bert. You didn't coach him to put on that act? Of course I didn't. Well... If it was a nightmare and he dreamed all those things about Mrs. Forbush and her mythical son, it was only because you filled his imagination full of stories. I have never mentioned either Mrs. Forbush or Jason to Robbie. Then there's a book about them somewhere around the house. Well, if there is, I haven't seen it. You must have had one of those imaginary conversations out loud, the way you do sometimes. And Robbie overheard you when you thought he was asleep. Oh, Bert, I don't do that anymore. And I don't see how he could possibly have been listening the night I talked to Mrs. Forbush. Marge. There is no Mrs. Forbush. How would you know? You weren't here. <sighs> Honey, we're taking this whole thing too seriously. Mrs. Forbush lived nearly 200 years ago, so she can't be hanging around here now. I suppose you're right. That's my girl. Give us a smile. Well, I, I'm, I'm trying. Now repeat after me. No more conversations with Mrs. Forbush. No more conversations with Lavinia Forbush. <laughs> Where'd you get that kooky first name? Well, she told yeah, me. Okay, okay. No more conversations with Lavinia Forbush. And what will we tell Robbie? Hey, Ma, look what Dad bought me. He's teaching me how to catch fish. Oh, well, it looks as though you bought out the store. But did you get my groceries? Yep. Groceries are all right here. But hold off on the steak. We just may come back with something very special for the frying pan. Look, Mom, my very own rod. Did you ever see one of these? This is a reel. Yes, dear, it looks like a very nice reel. Where will you use it, down at the wharf? Nope. We're going to get Rob off to a really good start. I've rented a boat. What kind of boat? Oh, just a putt-putt. You know, one of those flat bottom jobs with an outboard motor. But you, you aren't going out to sea. Sure. Well, look at it, Marge. Smooth as glass. What only... What do you know about the... Well, the tides and the currents. Marge, we aren't planning a trip to China. Where are you going? To that island. It's so clear today, you can see it from here. Don't you worry about a thing. See? I bought him a life jacket. And he's going to wear it every minute of the time. We promise, don't we, Rob? Sure, Pop. Promise me you won't go far? I told you, we're only going out to that island. When Mr. Smith said the fishing is good. What do you say the island's called? Hiram's Hideaway. Oh, yeah. Sorry I asked. Have a good time. If you stand on the porch with the binoculars, you can watch us most of the way. Well, Mrs. Desmond, I'm sorry you did not hear my warning. Oh, no, please, please don't come back. Well, I've not been away. But I don't want to talk to you. It was bad enough that you upset me, but you had no right to bother my son. It was you who interfered, Mrs. Desmond. You and your husband... You spoiled it all. I was trying to save your son before this happened. Nothing has happened, Mrs. Forbush, and I won't let you alarm me anymore. But you are alarmed, Mrs. Desmond, and well, you might be. Why did you let him go? See, they're already out of sight. And if you don't act quickly, you'll never see either your husband or your son again. This time it seems more likely that the predictions of the ghostly Mrs. Forbush may come true. 
Marjorie is a worrier, but after all, Bert is not a seasoned sailor. And Robbie can't swim. No, they're not setting off for China, but they are tempting fate. And it's too late to turn back now. It is a calm and beautiful day at Captain's Cove. And it looks as though the fears of Marjorie Desmond were totally unfounded. Father and son have explored the island. A whole new world has opened up for a boy who has been housebound much of his life. And Bert is savoring the joys of feeling a new closeness to his son. It is late afternoon, and they are heading back reluctantly to the mainland. Hey, Dad, can we do this every day? I'm going to catch a bigger one next time. For a first try, you did very well. Maybe we can go deep sea fishing someday. Maybe tomorrow. Korea. Hey, we're doing all right with these smaller fellows. Round is good eating. You'll see. I bet Mom will be surprised. We caught one, two, three, four. Hey, Dad, remember what you promised about that rock? Oh, it's late, Rob. I think we better not. But you promised, Dad. Honest, it'll only take a minute. Well, I'm not sure I can get right up to the rock. The water's starting to get a bit choppy. Where was it you saw that piece of driftwood you wanted? Uh, up there. See? Looks just like a couple of deer's horns. Otherwise known as antlers. Only I'm going to turn it into whatever whatever that other word is. Scrim, you know. Hey, stop the boat, Dad. It's right up there. I can't just stop the boat, Rob. There's no place to anchor. I could almost reach it if I stood on the sea. Get down, young man. Uh, uh... Now, what did I tell you? There's a tricky tide around here. You'll come back some other time. Oh, but, Dad, that piece of wood will be gone. Sometimes the waves go all over those rocks. I'll never find a piece like that one. Oh, uh-uh. I'll, I'll try again. It's calmer over on this side. Slow down some more, Dad. But there's no way to come in. By that flat place on the rock. You slow way down it, and then I'll jump off and get it. Is your life jacket on tight? Uh, sure, Dad. Okay, then. Be very, very careful. I'll idle the motor while you jump off. Grab your piece of driftwood and jump right back. Here I go! Uh-oh. The motor's died. And the boat's drifting. You stay right there, Rob, while I get it started. Yes. Yes. I want to speak to someone at the boathouse down by the pier. Uh, The place where you rent boats to go fishing? Hello? Hello, this is Mrs. Desmond. My husband and son, are they there? Uh, No. No, they rented a boat from you this morning to go to the island. Well, I expected them back long before this, and I was afraid something might have happened. Well, I I know it isn't late, but it is beginning to look stormy, and I can't see the island anymore. Uh, Could you send someone out to look for them? The Coast Guard Patrol? How do I reach them? Uh, No, 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 thank you. I'll go to their station down on the beach. No use going to the Coast Guard station, Mrs. Desmond. They've taken the cutter and gone in the other direction. But, but Bert and Rob, I'm afraid they're in trouble. They are in trouble, Mrs. Desmond. Out by Dead Man's Rock. Then we must send someone after them. No one to send, unless we do it ourselves. Uh, how can we? I've done it before. And if the two of us pull together... What are you talking about? Oh, boat over there... Can you handle an oar? Well, once I knew how to row, I'm not sure oh, that I... Hurry, Mrs. Desmond. Before the storm sets in, I'm aboard. Oh, oh. well, an old, old boat way. It's half full of water. No time to be choosy. You fit this oar in the lock while I shove off with the other one. There's a hole in the bottom of this boat, Mrs. Corbush. This is madness. We'll never make it. Oh, Mrs. Desmond. Oh. The sea is getting rough. Aye, a storm is brewing. We, we, we must turn back. Too late, Mrs. Desmond. Too late. We must fulfill our mission. That rock seems further and further away. Oh, Mrs. Desmond. Oh, oh. It's no use, Mrs. Forbush. We... 
We're going to stay hey, away from that warning bell. The boat is sinking, Mrs. Forbush. It's going straight to the bottom. We'll have to swim for it. Swim for the boy. Save yourself, Mrs. Denson. Until I can get closer. I can't seem to get this darn motor started. Hello! Who? Who are you? Hiram Forbush. At your service. Ca- Captain Forbush? Hey, uh, I am difficulty. I can't seem to get this stupid motor started. Give me wind and sails any time. But they're not going to help me now. My son and I... Is your boy over yonder? Yes. I should never have let him off on the rock. Dead man's rock's a dangerous place to be. But one of my men will get him. I'll be very grateful for anything you can do. We have to get home. Uh, couldn't you put us ashore in a, 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 a rowboat? Can't spare the men to take down a longboat. And my only rowboat was most rotted away. So I left it back on the beach. Oh, there must be some way... I'll pay you very well. All the money I want is out where we're going. And we can't stay around here any longer. So climb aboard and... No, no. I'll take my boy back in this boat and someone else will come along. They'll send the Coast Guard to look for us. You won't last long in that thing. There's a storm coming up. Then then please, send up some kind of a signal, a a flare, a a rocket. Send up a cannon and rouse the whole town. No need for that. We're not in any trouble. But we are. My son and I. You know how it is. I believe you have a son. I always wanted a son. Fine boy, this one. Just the right age for a first trip before the mast. Well, I'm giving you your last chance. Captain Forbush, let's be sensible. I have obligations to meet. Sounds to me as though you have a guilty conscience. Lively with the sheets, man. She's coming about. Up with the sails and dead ahead. Dad! Dad, you both stepping away! Oh, come around to the side, Rob. And, and jump! Daddy, I'm scared! Jump, Rob! Jump! Ah. That's it, Rob! Hey, dog paddle. The jacket will hold you up. Here, 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 son. Grab my fishing pole. Oh, I, I got it. Good boy. Hang on. That's it. Now, get hold of the side of the boat. Yeah. Oh, Dad, I lost my stick. Oh, forget it. Easy now. I've got you. Are you all right? I'm okay, Dad. Boy, boy. Can you see what I was doing? I was swimming. Well, not quite. Here, Rob. Here's some of these rags to dry off. I'm going to try this motor one more time. Rob, you made it. No, everything's going to be all right. Hey, Dad. Think sometime we could get a sailboat? I'd rather not think about this just now, Robbie. We've had a close call. Then yeah, maybe we can sail off. Robbie, no more. Well, I... Yeah. yeah, I hear someone calling. Well, that's not bad our imagination. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Over there, Dad. By that thing standing up in the water. Hello. Good Lord. There's someone clinging to the buoy. <laughs> Are you warm enough? Mm. Never felt better. And now, Marge, if you feel up to it, will you please tell us what in the name of heaven you were trying to do? Uh, we... That is, I started out in a rowboat. That rickety old rowboat that was down on the beach? Oh, yes. Did you know it was there? I hadn't seen it before. That boat must have been 100 years old. Why did you... I can't explain what was going on in my mind. Or at least you wouldn't understand... You see, I had this awful premonition that something terrible was going to happen to both of you and that I must row out as far as that rock to save you. Well, the boat sank and mercifully there was that buoy and 
Then you came along. Please don't ask me any more questions, because now that you're both safe, all those crazy notions I had are gone forever. But something did happen, didn't it, Bert? Something happened, all right. We were starting back when the motor conked out. And... Uh, you, you won't believe this, Marge, but suddenly everything was deathly still. And out of nowhere came this big old ship, like the one in the model over there. That's right, isn't it, Rob? Oh, Dad. And over the rail leaned that face with the cold blue eyes and the bristling red beard. None other than Captain Hiram Forbush. Oh, you're being mean, Bert, but I guess I deserve this. Go on. You don't believe me, do you, Marge? <laughs> but I tell you, there he was, big as life. I begged him to take us back to shore, but he said he was heading for the Caribbees. He had Robbie up on the deck while I was trying to start the motor. And then... And then that sailing ship started to take off. And I looked up, and that's when I yelled to Bobby to jump. Hey, Dad, that's the best story I ever heard. Now can I tell Mom what really happened? What really happened? You see, Mom, it was like this. I saw this piece of wood like, like antlers on that big rock. And I wanted to make something out of it. You know, some of that scrim stuff. And I begged Dad to let me get it. So he slowed down the boat and I jumped off. Oh, that was dangerous, Rob. Well, it would have been all right, except the motor conked out and the boat was drifting away. So I had to jump in the water or I'd still be on that rock. And, oh, Mom, I was scared. But, but I almost swam. <laughs> A swimming lesson for you tomorrow, Robbie. I promise. Mom, hmm? you tell me something, please? Yes, dear. What happened to Mrs. Fourbush? Robbie, why do you ask a question like that? I've been worried about her. She... She drowned, didn't she? Yes, Robbie. She drowned. But that was a long, long time ago. What happened to Mrs. Forbush was not as important as what happened to the Desmonds. A possessive mother learned she must loosen the bonds with which she held her only child or live in an ever-present nightmare of fear. And a self-centered father discovered that if he neglected his wife and son, he ran the risk of losing them. Such lessons are learned and sometimes forgotten in strange and frightening ways. The ghost of Mrs. Forbush has been laid to rest. But the captain, since no trace of his ship was ever found, you may see the Desdemona sometime off in the mists on a foggy day. The sights and sounds of the restless ocean stir something deep within the soul. There are countless tales to be told of the sea. We'll look for some to bring them along with other probings into those things which touch the dark and mysterious recesses of the human mind. Our cast included Patricia Wheel, Gordon Gould, Billy Lou Watt, Mary Jane Higby, and Guy Sorrell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... WOR Mystery Theater has been brought to you by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less, and by Suburban Savings, with offices throughout North Jersey. The preceding Mystery Theater program is furnished by the CBS Radio Network. I'm Fulton Lewis in the Mutual Broadcasting System Studios in Washington, D.C. Now, my commentary. President Ford carrying through with an idea that he unveiled only days after he took over the presidency... Today officially offered judicial forgiveness to thousands of Vietnam-era draft dodgers and deserters. Forgiveness on one condition. 
namely that they reaffirm their allegiance to the United States and work for up to 24 months in public service jobs to really underscore that allegiance. The amnesty program became effective immediately today when the president signed a proclamation and two executive orders during a brief nationally broadcast appearance in the White House cabinet room. Under that program, draft evaders and military deserters who have not been convicted or punished can turn themselves in before next January 31st, reaffirm their allegiance to the nation, and agree to spend up to two years in approved public service jobs, such as hospital orderly. The length of service, the president explained, could be reduced for mitigating circumstances. For men already convicted or punished for desertion or draft evasion, the president established a nine-member clemency board to review their cases as equitably and as impartially as is humanly possible. Just to ensure that the cases will be heard with a very sympathetic ear, the president appointed Charles Cadell, the former Republican senator from New York, and probably the most outspoken of all Republican critics of U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War, as the new chairman of the new Clemency Review Board. A second member of the board, the Reverend Theodore Hesburgh, has spoken out in favor of unconditional amnesty, and thus will be a second sympathetic listener to Clemency Appeals. He is, of course, the president of Notre Dame University, and like Goodell, he was a very ardent critic of U.S. Vietnam policy. Men now in prison will have their cases reviewed first, and officials said that their confinement would be suspended as soon as possible. The president explained that in dealing with amnesty, he was following the precedents set by other presidents who faced similar post-war situations. He specifically mentioned Abraham Lincoln and Harry Truman, a Republican and a Democrat. The president added, quote, My objective of making future penalties fit the seriousness of each individual's offense and of mitigating punishment already meted out in a spirit of equity has proved an immensely hard and complicated matter even more difficult than I knew it would be. He recalled his own words in announcing back on August 19th that he would give the men involved a chance to, as he said then, to earn their return to the mainstream of American society, With the divisive Vietnam War over for more than a year, the president said, I was determined then as now to do everything in my power to bind up the nation's wounds. You may be interested in some of the technical aspects of the amnesty order that was issued today by President Ford. Returning draft evaders will be required to report to U.S. attorneys within 15 days after they arrive back on American soil, while deserters will have to report to military commanders within that same grace period. Attorney General William Saxby said that he estimates that 2,500 draft resistors are going to take advantage of the conditional amnesty offer, and he said a larger number of deserters will also do so. Questioned by newsmen as he left a congressional hearing, Saxby said that the president's plan goes right down the line with recommendations submitted by both the Justice and the Defense Departments. Congressional reaction to the president's announcement was pretty mixed. Senate Republican Whip Robert Griffin of Michigan hailed the president's decision as a courageous, compassionate move, while House Republican Leader John Rhodes of Arizona said that it should have broad support on Capitol Hill. Among the Democrats, House Speaker Carl Albert said that he is accepting the president's leadership, but he added, quote, I don't know what he is going to do. Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield said that he will give full support to the program, But Alabama Democrat Senator James Allen seemed to be critical, saying that the action is going to be unfair to those who did serve in Vietnam. Senator Allen's view seemed to be the view of spokesmen for some of the nation's veterans organizations. John Stang, the commander-in-chief of the Veterans of Foreign Wars, said here in Washington today that the president's action does a gross injustice to those who did serve honorably, those who died and received wounds, and those who who were for so long imprisoned. Stang said that the veterans do not want revenge. He said all we ask for is justice. The president's program provides amnesty in exchange for the up to two years of alternative duty in public service jobs. Stang took issue with the idea of those public service jobs. He said why provide jobs for those who would not serve in Vietnam when the unemployment rate for the young Vietnam veterans is now over 10%. William Houck, the national adjutant of the American Legion, said that the president's plan violates the principles for which millions served their country honorably, thousands died in combat, and thousands more were wounded. Buss Mills, the executive director of the National League of Families of American Prisoners and Missing in Action in Southeast Asia, was equally unhappy about the president's announcement today, saying, We are completely bewildered and disillusioned. 
He complained that the president announced his amnesty program before he announced any plans to obtain an acceptable accounting for the 1,300 U.S. servicemen that are still unaccounted for in Southeast Asia. On the other side of the coin, Mary Ramberg of the Mississippi chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union said that those who evaded service have committed no crimes and yet the justice they're getting is really a mock trial outside the judicial system. Stephen Wayne Trim, a former Chatham, New York resident now living in Hamilton, Ontario, fled to Canada in 1969 after an appeals court refused to overturn his conviction on draft evasion charges. Trim, who sought exemption as a conscientious objector, was charged with bail jumping when he fled north. He said today the President Ford's plan leaves too many questions unanswered. He added, I would have to be assured, even if I may get amnesty for the initial conviction, that I will have immunity from the bail jumping charges. As for the job program, Trim said, it depends on the work. I have nothing against humanitarian work if it is truly humanitarian, but who knows yet what it is precisely going to be. Here are some of the statistics regarding the program that was unveiled today. Officials say that about 15,500 draft evaders are potentially eligible for the clemency. Of these, about 8,700 have already been convicted and another 4,350 are under indictment. Of those under indictment, 4,060 are listed as fugitives and an estimated 3,000 of them are currently in Canada. Prison sentences now are being served by 130 persons who were convicted of draft evasion. According to officials, some 500,000 incidents of desertion falling within the scope of the clemency program were recorded during the Vietnam War. They said 660 deserters now are serving prison sentences or are awaiting trial, and about 12,500 deserters are still at large with about 1,500 of them in Canada. To be eligible for clemency, deserters would have to have committed offenses between August 4, 1964, that is the date of the Senate's Tonkin Golf Resolution, and March 28, 1973, the day the last U.S. combat soldier left Vietnam. Clemency will not be considered for deserters or evaders who face other unrelated charges. The President's proclamation today did not specify the types of jobs under the alternate service program, but officials said that they would be the same as those filled by conscientious objectors in the past, and roughly half of those jobs were in hospitals or other institutions, such as homes for the elderly. The salaries would be paid by the private employers. Officials said mitigating factors include cases of extreme hardship, willfulness of the violation, and the individual's behavior during the time he was being sought. By way of comment, it seems to me that the president's action today was very much in harmony with his handling of the Richard Nixon case. In both instances, Mr. Ford apparently has tried to weigh the facts of the situation and then do what he thinks is just. In both instances, in my view, justice has been the net product. Justice, as I discussed last week, is merited reward or punishment, or so it is defined in Webster's Dictionary. In the case of Richard Nixon, there has been an admission of some misconduct or at least mistakes on the part of the former president, and there has certainly been punishment, the end of a political career and perhaps even of a private business career, plus the personal anguish that has touched not only Mr. Nixon but his entire family, and of course in the Nixon case, there is also the added problem of an apparently serious illness, a very serious illness, which Mr. Ford may well have taken into consideration when he spared Richard Nixon of any prosecution for any criminal offenses which may have been committed during his presidency. In the case of the Vietnam deserters and draft dodgers, there is now the gesture of goodwill and compassion on the part of the United States government, but there is also going to be merited punishment coming in the form of those two years of public service work. That, in my view, constitutes justice. Let's try to heal the wounds of both Watergate and Vietnam, and let's work quickly to make both of them chapters of ancient American history. President Ford announced today that the White House staff chief, uh, the chief of Staff Alexander Haig, Jr., is being recalled to active military duty and will soon become Supreme Commander of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization Forces. In the meantime, meeting here in Washington, the Republican National Committee today unanimously approved its first woman chairman, it also heard President Ford declare the November election in a battle to elect an inflation-proof Congress. From the Mutual Studios in Washington, I'm Fulton Lewis, and that's the top of the news as it looks from here.